Hello, and welcome to another edition of Mountaineers Vote. I'm Lisa DiBartolomeo, and I'm a professor in the Department of World Languages in the Everly College of Arts and Sciences here at West Virginia University. With me today is my friend, John Kilwine, professor and chair of political science, also in the Everly College of Arts and Sciences. And today, Dr. Kilwine has agreed to share with us his expertise to help us understand the Electoral College. So Dr. Kilwine, where does the Electoral College come from? Who invented it? So um, the Electoral College is part of our second constitution. And, and because of that, we have to remind ourselves that the constitution is, it, it was a compromise uh, between a lot of competing interests and that our constitution was an experiment that the framers really didn't see it as kind of the final truth to be written in stone. In fact, they knew they were, they were trying something new and they, they you know, and doing some experimental things. And so, and we also have to remind ourselves that while the, the American constitution is incredibly important and innovative, that it's also inherently flawed in some significant ways, especially when we think about that slavery is baked into its DNA. And so, and we also have to remind ourselves and, and you know, which is the way it was, but it was written by 18th century white male elites who had a fear of too much democracy. They wanted some democracy, but they also felt that, uh, you know, kind of from the British and the European tradition that elites can govern better and that you wanna bring the people in, but you don't wanna bring them in, in, in with complete control. And so, the Electoral College kind of comes relatively late in the convention. Uh, the framers are getting, it's hot. They, they, they have to get their work done and they kind of left deciding how we were gonna select our new president. We, hadn't, we didn't have a president in the Articles of Confederation. How are we gonna select this new president? And so they, ruled, they originally tinkered around with maybe Congress would select the president and they, they said no to that. And they talked about a direct election by the people and they, they had a fear of too much democracy. So they nixed that and they come up with this electoral college. So article two, section one of the constitution. And basically what they do is they give power to the state legislatures, the state legislative bodies to determine how these electors are going to um, be picked. This electoral college, which isn't a college, it's a grouping, but uh, and the number of, they, they, and, and you know, the constitution is really about maintaining state rights at some level. And so the numbers of electors that a state got was based on how many seats it had in the Senate and the House. So two Senate seats plus however many House seats. One of the big problems though with it was the, the and it's one of the big problems of the original constitution was the three fifths clause that gave Southern states uh, they could count uh, for every enslaved uh, African American counted as three fifths of a, of a citizen. And so that gave them a lot more representation in the house and therefore gave them a lot more representation in the electoral college. The plan, as I said, was designed to protect state interests. Um, so it's like the, the Bundesrat in, in the German uh, system today. It, it, it was also designed to uh, protect smaller state interests. And again, that overlaps heavily with Southern states. And it was designed to increase the likelihood that presidents, uh, presidential ca candidates would focus on broader national themes rather than what's popular in a large state. Um, and one other little constitutional thing is that they realized pretty early on, and it goes back to the framers knew that this constitution wasn't perfect as it was written, is the 12th amendment modified the uh, electoral college in significant ways. Most importantly, it said that electors had to cast separate ballots for president and vice president. So prior to the 12th amendment, uh, electors came in and they used both their votes because they had a vote for each, but they put double, they doubled down on their per preferred presidential candidate. So that had to be, that had to be tweaked. Hmm. Well, what about the current electoral college? So the current electoral college, uh, it, it basically has, uh, um, 400 and, uh, 438 uh, seats. So that's, uh, and if you do your math, I'm sorry, 538 seats. And so if you do your math quickly, you say, well, that's three extra because 100 in the Senate, 435 in the House. But of the, um, uh, the 23rd Amendment in 1961 gave uh, DC three electors. And so DC has three electors. So it's 538. Um, it ranges from California has a high of 55. 
Uh, seven small population states have uh, uh, three seats and DC has three seats. Um, again, for a grand total of 538. 270 is the smallest majority to win. So that's why we're all focused right now on 270. Um, 48 states and DC give, have a winner take all system. So whoever wins that state in the popular vote wins all of the electors. And so that gives rise to some concerns. Um, Maine and Nebraska, they buffer this. And so the, the winner takes two seats and then they apportion the rest based on the kind of a proportional uh, uh, counting of, of the uh, election. And then we get into the technicals and this is, you know, people think baseball's boring and cricket's boring. This gets pretty boring. So the, the federal law requires the electors to meet and it's, it's in there the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December following their apportionment. And so one of the things that people legitimately probably mistake is the electors don't come into a big national college, but they meet in their individual states. And so they vote in December and then they send their votes into a Congress and then Congress in a joint session. So the House and the Senate come together and they count, uh, they count the votes and hopefully we get to a majority. And so that uh, we, the, it produces a, a president and it produces a, um, a vice president. But the framers thought about it and if it gets tied, if there's a tie, then the House uh, chooses the president and the, uh, and the uh, Senate chooses the vice president. But one of the concerns about the House is it's got 435 members, but each state gets only one vote. So it's 50 votes. And so a state, a state like uh, California or, or New York, which is heavily Democratic, or take a state like Utah, which is heavily Republican, um, actually, uh, when it all boils down, it's the majority of their, of their uh, representatives. So it could, it could change things a little bit if, if, if it got to that, and that would be quite a, that would be quite a mess. But um, the, so the House votes would be 50 votes, and in the Senate, it's the normal 100 votes. Wow, that's, that's pretty confusing. Um, <laughs> Why, why all of the hullabaloo? Don't presidents who win the popular vote, vote win both the popular vote and the electoral college? Most of the time they do, but there are exceptions and two very recent exceptions that you know, are fresh in people's memory. So uh, the elections of 1876 and 1888, the victor of the majority uh, of the popular vote did not win the presidency. But more recently, uh, President, uh, President Bush in 2000 did not have a majority of the votes. Um, uh, Al Gore did. And, and the last election, 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton had significantly more uh, votes, but, but did, lost the electoral college. So it, it, it does happen. And it's, now it's happening. You, know, you, you, you have to say, I mean, 2000 and 2016, that's, that's, that's fresh. It's, 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 it's affecting things. It's definitely fresher than 1876 and 1880. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in spite of these, let's say four exceptions, are there benefits to having, to keeping the electoral college? Well, I mean, I'm gonna say personally, my humble opinion is absolutely not. It's, it's anti-democratic. It's, it is a vestige of a different time. It's a, it's a, at best, it's an innocent mistake, I think by the framers uh, for again, a very different period in our country's history. It, uh, it is very biased against states with large urban areas. And that, uh, whether by design or not, has, uh, has you know, racial implications because uh, urban areas tend to have more diverse populations. And so that means you're, you're kind of undercutting um, certain groups, you're undercutting their ability to affect the presidential election. It, uh, the flip side, which is just the obvious other side, is it that favors rural states. And I certainly have nothing against rural states, but uh, that Wyoming could have, you know, proportionally uh, more, a, a voter in Wyoming could have proportionally more power to elect the president than somebody in California raises some real, some real, you know, equity concerns. Um, as, as viewers of Pittsburgh television, no, it is, it, it focuses way too much attention on swing states and their voters and their concerns and ignores other states and their concerns and it discourages turnout in non-competitive states. So, I mean, honestly, a citizen in West Virginia 
which is very likely to go to, to President Trump or a citizen in Hawaii, which is very likely to go to Vice President um, uh, Biden could say, why, why do I have to bother? I mean, you know, it's, it, my vote's really not gonna matter in this. And, and what that does is then it has problem, it creates problems for down ballot, you know, candidates. If, if people say, well, my vote's not gonna matter, then they're not gonna vote for Senator. They're not gonna vote for members of the house. They're not gonna vote for mayors and councilmen and council persons. And, and so that, you know, that creates problems as well. Right, right. Well, and given what you said about how fundamentally undemocratic the electoral college is, have we tried in the past to get rid of it, to change it? How would it work to just abolish it? So to change it, we would have to amend the constitution. There is one, there is one, uh, footnote to that, but, but, but basically we'd have to amend the constitution and eliminate it and replace it with something which gets us into a complicated other set of issues, but uh, probably some way of, of, of going from a direct, uh, direct vote. But after the election of 1968, when President Nixon ran against uh, Vice President Humphrey and, and Governor George Wallace, who right, ran a, a very white supremacist kind of uh, a campaign, it was a very close election, and um, the, you know there were fears that that this shouldn't be allowed to happen, and so Congress uh, adopted a, a you know a draft of a constitutional amendment to eliminate the electoral college, but ultimately, and it looked like that was the closest you know historically that it was going to happen, but senators from southern states and smaller states, but specifically, but, but fundamentally from southern states filibustered it, prevented it from being considered because it would take away significant power from the South. So again, you know, the, the three-fifths clause gave the South outsized power during slavery, but the three, but, but even with the Voting Rights Act and even with, you know, even with the, with the, the, the Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, uh, up until the, uh, to the Voting Rights Act, um, the state still, the Southern states still had outsized power because they, now they went from three-fifths to five-fifths, but, but most African-Americans couldn't vote because of voter suppression. And, and even, with, even with the Voting Rights Act, it still was difficult. It, it, you know, there were still problems. It wasn't complete uh, uh, participation among that, uh, that, that portion of the electorate. And so um, Southern state senators came out and said, you know, th this is the one bit of power we still have and, and we're not gonna give it up. So, um, it, 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 it failed. You know, there is one, there is one kind of um, plan that's kind of floating around out there that the 50 states would voluntarily do what Nebraska and Maine do and apportion more proportionately. But again, <clears throat> that would take 50 states to do it. And there are gonna be some states that, I mean, why would Wyoming do that? It would give, it would lose some of the power, not to pick on Wyoming, but it has the smallest population. The, the, why would it give up its outsized power? It's hard to imagine that uh, they would do it just for the, you know, for the, um, the ethical reason, you know, I, I just, it's, it's hard. I, I guess I'm a cynical political scientist, but it's hard to imagine that. You, you said that 50 states have to sign on to that apportionment um, idea. How many states so far? Signed on. Um, you know, I, I haven't. I, I know there are some that have looked it up. I didn't mean to say it like that. I didn't mean that it had. I'm just saying that to be effective, it would. You'd really. You. You wouldn't want to give up your power again, unless you were doing it out of the goodness of your heart, and uh, uh, unless others were going to do it. And so, I guess you could make the argument that you know it's kind of like with the greenhouse gases. It's better that we do it, even if other countries don't do it. The Paris Accords, but. Um, but if for people who want to who want to see an elimination of the electoral college, you really would want a substantial majority of the fifty states to do it, or it wouldn't it wouldn't um, it wouldn't achieve you know what the ultimate goal is. So it sounds like it would take a lot of first of all will on the individual states and probably pretty serious education campaign to help people understand what the electoral college is and why it's not quite democratic to, to keep it. So that doesn't sound very hopeful. You don't, you don't think we'll ever change it? Right now, um, there is a, one party does benefit from it, uh, you know, and it is the Republicans who won uh, the office in 2000 and 2016. Um, and so as long as one party sees an advantage in it, um, it's hard to imagine 
it's hard to imagine that, you know, and, and the framers made constitutional amendments hard. So it, it's hard to imagine that we could, we could see kind of a groundswell that would affect, you know, Democrats and Republicans. Is, and it, there is an interesting footnote that uh, in doing research for this, John Kerry um, in the 2004 election against President Bush, uh, he came very close to winning Ohio. It was a small, small percentage that he lost by. And if he had won Ohio, it would have been it would have flipped George Bush George W Bush's victory, and Kerry would have won by electoral college, not by the majority of the vote. And you know if if it, it's too bad in many ways, at least from my personal perspective, that didn't happen. But but just from an electoral college perspective, it, it, then both parties would have been bitten in the butt, and and maybe that would have made it more likely that they they think about changing. Okay, so. You, you basically set it up to be really, really difficult to change or abolish the electoral college, but there are other ways to kind of skirt around maybe some of the restrictions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about faithless electors, the so-called faithless electors and what the recent Supreme Court decision said about them? So, so we, we have these 538 individuals, they're, they're selected to represent the states. But one of the questions all the way back, people wondered is, well, what if they go in and they decide to, you know, if, if I were, if I were pit, picked to, to represent my state, West Virginia, who elected Donald Trump, and I go in and I say, I'm not going to vote for Donald Trump, or I'm going to vote for uh, uh, Mitt Romney to, to, to lessen Donald Trump's, or I'm going to go straight out and just vote for, for Biden. I mean, that you're, you're not living up to the, you're not living up to what you committed to, or, you know, kind of the, the idea of your job. And so that makes you a faithless elector. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's an issue that people have paid attention to, you know, looking back at the history, it, ha it has some potential effects. And if it, it would, it would be close, I guess it could. Um, 33 states have laws that forbid it. So 33 states say it's, you can't be, you can't do that. But the problem is only 16 states have enforcement, uh, or I'm sorry, 16 states don't have enforcement mechanisms. So that means 17 states have enforcement mechanisms. The, um, the Supreme Court in two decisions, Chiafalo and um, Colorado versus Baca, uh, 2020 case, combined cases, the Supreme Court said that if the states have enforcement laws, they're allowed to enforce that. So you can punish faithless electors, but, um, you know, I think it's kind of an interesting issue, but I don't know. I don't know how. But who knows? I mean, if, if things get really close, but um, the states clearly haven't taken it that seriously. If if you have 27 states that don't even don't have legislate about it, and then you only have 17 states that 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 um, really target it with punishments. But uh, yeah, it's a faithless as an elector is a person without faith. He she, he or she didn't uh, live up to his or her job. And so is it very common? Is that why there are so, so few enforcement mechanisms and so few states that have laws ab about them? I think so. I mean, I went back and looked, I can't remember the exact numbers. There, were some, there was some faithless activity, but it wasn't, it, it didn't. Um, Not rampant. Yeah. Okay. But who knows, maybe we could get to a point where it is like, you know, 268 to 268, you know, who knows? I mean. <laughs> let's let's, let's hope not, not this year. I can't think. The universe. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, a lot of a lot of folks who pay attention to politics and are watching the elections are trying to encourage people to see election day as not being the end point, but to think about it more broadly and to think about maybe an election several days, an election week, to to help communicate the understanding that not all of the results are likely to be in on Tuesday, November third, even after the polls close that night. So. What should we be looking for on election day 2020 or the days or even weeks thereafter? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point. And I think the first point you made is what people really do have to, we have to shift our attention. I mean, it is fun. You know, we're going to have a day off. We're going to, we're going to pay attention. We stay up all night. We think we've, we, you know, we hope our side's going to win. But I think that there's a, there's a significant chance that might not be the case this time. Um, so we do have to prepare ourselves and be adults and say that, you know, it's not going to be Tuesday, November the 3rd, necessarily. It might be Tuesday, uh, November the 9th, or it could be two, you know, who knows. But I did look it up, and, and it, it is interesting. Two key states, two swing states, it gets us back to those swing states, 
Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, which everybody keeps talking about, the, their state laws don't allow uh, the elect election officials to start counting those mail-in ballots until the day of the election. So we can almost be certain that we're not going to get results from, well, we can't be certain, but it's going to be, it's hard to imagine we're going to get final results from Pennsylvania and Wisconsin on uh, next, next Tuesday. But right. then flip it around, you know, states, uh, Michigan, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, Texas, Texas is theoretically in play. All of those states, uh, I think, have better laws in that they, they, they allow the state officials to count the ballots. And so we are likely to see, you know, we're more likely to see final results in those states. And so that's why some people are saying that if you see, if you see a, a significant win in Michigan and Florida, uh, which we should see election night, then that could be a pretty good tipping off point. But I, I, I you know, I think it's going to look, it's 2020. I mean, think of everything that's happened in 2020. So why would we have a seamless, you know, happy election night result? We're probably not going to. Yeah, that, that would be too much to ask. And, yeah. and so because Florida and Michigan count the mail-in ballots as they come in, then they will actually be further along to finalizing their tally. And I know that in West Virginia, we talked to uh, Mon County uh, clerk, Carrie Blaney, and she told us that West Virginia also doesn't start counting the absentee ballots until election day. So it definitely makes it a much harder lift. Obviously West Virginia has a smaller population than Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, but it clearly is going to have an effect on the perceived results as soon as the polls close and then how quickly they can they can generate those yeah and especially if one candidate uh, says that you know we should uh cast the election in amber on tuesday night and and again that again there's the partisan differences so you know the republicans anticipate they don't know for sure but they anticipate that more of their voters are going to vote in person and more democrats are going to vote uh, via you know early vote well early voting will be counted but by mail and so that you could have you know, which is which sets up for you know crazy, interesting headlines, right? So if on Tuesday you go to bed Tuesday night in Pennsylvania, President Trump is ahead because in Allegheny County and Philadelphia County there was a substantial usage of mail-in ballots. You know, it 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 will shift. It it, it is likely to shift, and so that that ties into that kind of um, um, repudiation of, of mail-in ballots. And so um, it's, it, it really does go back to what you said originally. We have to be, we have to be patient and wait for the process to, to, to play out. Well, I'm not sure that left me with a good feeling in the pit of my <laughs> stomach, but I, I think it is good advice to, to everyone who, who may be watching this to keep in mind that it's not just election night, that it's not just, we'll all know everything as soon as the polls close in whatever time zone you're in. It's it's gonna be a process and it's gonna take maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks, uh, but every vote must count. Yeah, and, and I know you're too young to remember, but remember in 2000 that uh, we had to wait a long, long, long time to find out who was gonna be president. Right, it was December, right? Yep. When the yep. Supreme Court said, stop counting. That's right. There you yeah. go. That's, uh, that's not something I think we, we want to live through again. <laughs> um, but on that cheerful note. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you, John Kilwine, for helping us to understand the Electoral College. It is extremely confusing. And uh, in addition to the videos that we've already done with um, Voting 101, with Voter Behavior 101, uh, and we're gonna have a few more in November. And hopefully those will be a little bit more targeted to helping us to talk to our relatives and friends <laughs> who might disagree with us politically. So even for a socially distanced Thanksgiving or other holidays, the conversation over pumpkin pie might be a little awkward. And we'd like to help give you some strategies for civil as well as civic engagement with your, with your friends and loved ones. So I'd like to thank you all again for joining us for this webinar and to reiterate again and again and again, please vote, your voice matters. Thank you. <laughs>